So what does it mean to be a woman? Is there a fundamental biological script that we are overriding or merely social expectations that we are shunning? Well, there is a god-awful confusion between sex and gender. Sex, we used to think of sex, we used to believe that sex is biologically determined by something called gametes, a certain type of cells, sex cells. And we, we, we've honestly and firmly and sincerely believed until well into the 1960s that sex is exclusively determined by gametes in, in a sexual differentiation process during the pregnancy and that people are born either men or women, either male or female, I'm sorry. So sex is about being male or female. Today, we know a lot more. And we know that about 2% of people are born with an indeterminate sex. We also know that hormonal cascades, hormonal developments in later life, can absolutely change one's sexuality and, and psychosexuality to the point that one has gender dysphoria, which is a bad name, it, a, bad, a, bad, a bad label. It should have been sex dysphoria. So we know that someone can be born as a man, but having been, been exposed to certain hormones in the womb and later on in life, etc., etc., he can definitely feel that he's a female. He's born male, but he can feel that he's a female and vice versa. So there is the concept of sex fluidity. Regrettably, it is hyped beyond measure, but it does exist. I also see nothing wrong in adolescents experimenting with sexual identities. Sooner or later, all adolescents settle on a single sexual identity. Now, this sexual identity can be, can be pansexuality, can be bisexual, bisexuality, can be, it doesn't have to be male-female. We have about I think eight or nine sexual identities nowadays, which are rec recognized and recognizable and documented in literature for thousands of years, by the way. <laughs> so um, I don't see anything wrong in, in an adolescent experimenting. Actually, adolescents had always experimented with homoeroticism and homosexuality, even in the 1940s, even in the 1920s, even in the 19th century. people. When boys were growing up, they were experimenting with homosexuality. It, it was a well-known documented phenomenon. So people experiment as adolescents and then they settle on a single, a single, usually lifelong identity and there is type constancy after that. So sex is largely dependent and largely determined biologically on birth, but people can transition and there is sexual or sex fluidity. And in adolescence, it might even be a good idea to encourage people to explore the whole range until they can conveniently and safely and comfortably settle into a single uh, sex, sex um, um, kind of role. So this is sex. While sex in something like 90% of the cases is determined at birth and is stable across the lifespan, Gender is com a completely different thing. Now remember, sex is male-female. We have sex in all the animal kingdom, male and female. Well, all the advanced organisms have sex. Definitely mammals have sex like male and female. Sexual reproduction is the favorite strategy in nature. Um, if we ignore, for example, protozoa and uh, microbes and so on, I mean, if we talk about evolved complex organisms, sexual reproduction is by far the, the favorite strategy of nature. Um, we transfer genes usually uh, onwards, intergenerationally, using sexual reproduction. So this is sex. And what one could one could say pretty safely that sex is fixed, is fixed. At the margins, there are people who are fluid and they can transition from one sex to another, but sex is a pretty fixed thing, not so gender. Sex is male-female, gender is men-women. Men-women is a social, cultural construct. It has no foundation, no real strong foundation in biology. It so happens that people with vaginas 
were assigned the gender of women and people with penises were assigned the gender of men. But there is no biological foundation to decide that a specific gender role should forever be assigned to someone with a specific set of genitalia or that a specific gender role should be universal across all periods of history in all societies, all cultures and all geographical regions. Actually, this is counterfactual. It's not true. Gender roles, there are like thousands of gender roles throughout history in various cultures, societies, periods, etc. Gender roles are inverted in northern Albania, which is a highly traditionalist and conservative country. There are women there who are considered to be men and treated as men. Gender roles are in inverted in many, many tribes in Africa, in Latin America, in the Amazon, etc., etc. Many primitive early societies had inverted gender roles, including passages in the Bible. Gender is not a fixed thing. Gender is a social convention, essentially, and the outcome of upbringing. To start with, as Butler had noted, gender is performative. It's a performance. Gender is what men do, how they act, including in sex. Um, gender is what women do, how they act, their choices, including in sex. So sex is sex underlies gender and kind of kind of integrates with it in some way, but as a performance. When you grow, when people grow up, they are being consistently told. Girls don't do this. Boys don't do this. This is the way you should behave. To be a man, to grow up and be a man. This is the set of actions, choices, decisions, body language, etc. that you should adopt. It's, it's a stereotype. It's a role. And people are brought up to perform these roles. So gender is performative. Gender is also the outcome of socialization. Society wants us to perform specific roles. For example, there was a period in human history where society valued children very much, especially, for example, during the colonial times when they needed surplus population to take over colonies. So during that period, 17th, 18th and 19th century, women were encouraged to stay at home, reproduce and raise children. Society needed it. Men were encouraged to be testosterone laden, aggressive, and so on, because society needed soldiers. Societal needs shape and determine gender roles. Today, for example, society needs women to be promiscuous. They need them to not have committed relationships. Society needs women to not have committed relationships. Society needs women to postpone, delay marriage and not have children. Why? Because society wants women to be to integrate in the workforce, to integrate in the workforce and to become consumers. The overriding need of society today is to equate gender roles, to make to create a unigender where everyone, regardless of genitalia, is a consumer and a producer. Now children get in the way of this. Family, families, marriages, committed relationships, intimacy, they get in the way of profits and income and consumption and production, which are the ultimate values. They are the gods of today. They are the idols of today. Money, the bottom line, profits. So these are the values of today. So gender roles today had shifted to reflect these social preferences. Similarly, gender roles reflect dominance, submission. Men are supposed to be dominant. Women are supposed to be submissive. Now, everyone in, in the manosphere will tell you this is the natural and biological way of things. That's utter unmitigated nonsense. In numerous species, it is the, the female who is super dominant and the male who is submissive. There's nothing in nature that preordains this. Nothing in the biology of men and women determines who will be dominant and who will be submissive. Yes, men have higher 
muscle mass. They have more muscles. Women, by the way, are better adapted to modern, postmodern society and its exigencies and demands. But men, for a very long time, during the agricultural and early industrial revolution, men had leveraged their, mu their muscles to dominate society and, and exert uh, control over women, subdue, subjugate, and submit them. So, but this is, this is a historical accident. Had we started with the, with the, for example, had we started with the industrial revolution or the information revolution in ancient Babylon, we would have had a matriarchy. Men would have been nothing. They wouldn't be dominant, they would be submissive. And indeed, in many societies throughout history, there were matri matriarchies, there were, women were in control, they were dominant. In, in quite a few societies to this very day, women marry multiple men. <laughs> they are, and in, in, today in the West, 43% of primary breadwinners, the, the, the providers, those who bring the money, those who bring the, the bread home, those who bring the money home, they're women, 43%. And about half of all children are raised by single parent, in single parent households, majority of which are women. So dominance and submission is, is a socially imposed interpretation of what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, and an integral underlying foundation of gender roles. Then there is the issue of gendered personality. We are taught to become gendered. Part of our identity formation is our gender. It's not like you're an accountant. Your identity is not that you're an accountant. Your identity is that you are, I don't know, uh, a man, a woman. So gender, masculine, feminine, is an integral part of your identity, unlike, for example, your profession or your academic accomplishments or degrees or whatever. And so we are taught from an early age that this job, this job, it's a job of being a man, this job of being a woman, this job of being a father, this job of being a mother, this job of being a mas masculine, this job of being feminine, these are jobs, these are absolute jobs. We are taught that these are the only jobs that are part of our identity. If you later become a PhD, that's not part of your identity. If you become an accountant, that's not part of your identity. But if you are training to be a man, that's part of your identity. If you are about to become a mother, that is part of your identity. We took a, a set of jobs, a set of employment opportunities, a set of, and, and we made them, we made them a part of our identity. And they are not, they should not be. That you're a man or a woman should not be a part of your identi identity because that is a societal imposition in accordance with society's needs, not your needs. Now, you may feel comfortable being a man or a woman, no problem with that. But just try to not feel comfortable and you will see the societal backlash against, for example, transgender and tra transsexual people. So, masculine and feminine are narratives, societal narratives, that tell you that you can't have a complete and whole identity if you don't have a gender. Even though a gender is total fiction. It's a job. And finally, there's the issue of boys and girls. We can't ignore the fact that women raise both boys and girls. Children, regardless of their genitalia, are raised by women. Now, that creates, that creates an asymmetry in the way boys and girls are raised. Naturally, naturally, women have more affinity to girls, even if they don't admit it, even if they are totally infatuated with, the, with their boys, rather than their girls, it's still, studies have shown that women raise girls differently to the way that they raise boys. For example, they are much more emotionally open and empathetic with their girl children than they are with their boy children. Gradually, boys are learn to separate from the mother 
not only in a good way, but in some ways, in, in some dysfunctional ways, in some not so good ways. They learn, for example, boys learn, for example, that to express one's emotions is unmanly. Now, men today are, are softer. They're more effeminate. In other words, they had adopted some elements of the feminine gender role. But still, they're very averse to expressing, expressing emotions, crying in public, admitting to vulnerabilities. They're much more averse than women. There's a, a mountain of studies on this. And why are they averse? Because that's the way they had been brought up by the, their mothers. The mother broadcasts to the, ch to the boy, to the boy child. The mother broadcasts, I'm much closer emotionally to, to my girl than to you. And the boy takes this on board and he understands that he shouldn't burden his mother and impose on her his emotions because she reserves her emotions to the girl, not to him as a boy. Now, this has been documented and observed, and actually it constitutes one of, one of the arguments in modern feminism. And theoretically, the presence of a male, the presence of a father, should balance this, but it doesn't. It doesn't because women monopolize the formative years, zero to six, absolutely monopolize. Psychodynamically, the father has an extremely limited function before the age of six. And these are the, this is the critical age where we get all the messages that tell us how to be, who to be. So our identity formation, these are the critical years. We become who we are. We, we have identity diffusion well into age 21, but the figments, the elements of our identity, we acquire these in the first formative years where mommy is in charge to the exclusion of daddy. And boys get a different treatment, bordering on discrimination. Even if they are loved and adored and admired, they're loved and adored and admired in a way different to girls. It could well be one of the main reasons for the current gender wars and the problems between men and women. This is, these are my com this is my commentary on, on the questions. I wish to thank my client for raising them. I hope I provoked your thoughts as she had provoked mine. Thank you for listening, men, women, males and females. During this forced vacation from my YouTube channel, what else can I contemplate but gender dysphoria, transgenders. And today we are going to discuss two topics, much shunned, much censored, much feared, much suppressed. The first one is the phenomenon of transgenderism. Is it a form of social contagion? Also, we are going to touch upon narcissism and how it may be connected to transgender phenomena. But first and foremost, is it communicable? Is it, as some conservative thinkers say, and some scholars, is it, um, is society, is social pressure, peer pressure, is this a vector of transmission, so to speak, of transgender inclinations? That's the first question. And the second question is detransitioning. How widespread is it? And what does it teach us about the transgender phenomenon? First of all, before we proceed, I've been saying repeatedly in numerous videos, there is a huge difference between sex and gender. Sex is assigned at birth. And it's usually based on visible genitalia. It's assigned by the delivering doctor. Gender is learned, it's acculturated, it's socialized, it's performative. That's why we call it gender role. People with specific sex organs, secondary or primary, can choose a gender 
which is non-conforming, a gender which does not conform to their genitalia or other sexual, um, other sex parts. So, gender and sex are to two totally different issues. And here starts the major confusion. Gender dysphoria is actually very often about sex, not about gender, or not only about gender. <laughs> it should have been called appropriately sex dysphoria or sexual dysphoria or something containing the word sex. But it's called gender dysphoria. It's been called gender dysphoria for like forever, for decades. And this created god awful confusion. Both sexuality and gender are fluid. Even sex itself, which is supposedly a biological determinant, even that is fluid. It can be changed. But gender definitely is fluid. Gender roles. Sexual orientation is fluid and very often changes over the lifespan. So there's a lot of fluidity and plasticity built into sexuality, gender, and even sex. And the confusion is so massive that we all stumble in the dark, <laughs> talking at cross purposes, not being able to communicate meaningfully. And whenever communication fails us, wherever, whenever language breaks down, emotions erupt, especially negative affectivity, emotions such as anger, fear of the unknown. So today, I'm going to do my little best to contribute to throwing some light on some of the more convoluted and dark alleys of this debate, if you can call it debate. <laughs> it's more like a skirmish or a, squir a quarrel. My name is Sam Vaknin. I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, and former and current professor of psychology and finance. Having dispensed with this, let's delve right in. Moira uh, Shilaji, I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly. <laughs> Moira, Moira Shilaji <clears throat> is the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, AAP. And she released no fewer than two statements. One, in August, on August 22nd last year, 2022. This statement was published in the Wall Street Journal of all places. The other statement uh, followed um, three days later on the 20, um, 25th of August, 2022, and it was in the form of an AAP daily briefing. Presumably, she was just trying to clarify the Wall Street Journal um, widely misunderstood um, statement that she had released. She was trying to clear the air, because the debate has become vicious and pernicious and poisonous and aggressive to the point of violence and very often spilled into violence. And a lot of the debate revolves around the question or the issue of is gender dysphoria a clinical entity? Is it a real thing? Is it a true condition similar, let's say, to cancer or tuberculosis or schizophrenia? Is it a disorder or is it just a choice? Is it a lifestyle or is it dictated by biology? And what's the contribution of biology? What about society and culture? How do gender roles interact with underlying biological sex? And how do the two put together create sexuality? None of these, ans none of these questions, believe it or not, have clear answers. So she referred to um, two papers. And the two papers dealt with a very, very difficult, ornery question. Can gender dysphoria be learned? Is it mimicked? Is it the outcome of exposure to other gender dysphoric individuals? It's as if gender dysphoria was kind of uh, some kind of epidemic, <laughs> uh, contagion, and in, with an infectious agent, a pathogen. 
So the two papers were published. Um, the first one was published in 2018. Uh, at the time, there was a health expert working in Brown University. And they, they hypothesized, they proposed the existence of a condition called rapid onset gender dysphoria, ROGD. The lead author, a woman, described rapid onset gender dysphoria as a social contagion, or at least one of the reasons for ROGD was supposed to have been social contagion. When the paper was published, it ignited a firestorm. There was criticism from every segment of, of the population, not least of which from the transgender community. And of course, immediately the paper was withdrawn and suppressed and censored and eliminated and burned at the stake and shredded, <laughs> which is what, what many of you would like to do to me. Okay, Shoshanim, was this paper published in 2018, was it supported by any research? The truth is not really. And the even bigger truth is there's no research about transgender issues. The topic is so sensitive, is so politically incorrect or politically correct, depending on which side of the woke movements you are, that academics stay away, they shy away from it. We don't have any data as to transgender phenomena, including surgical interventions, gender affirming care, nothing. We know nothing about any of this. We haven't followed up on people. We don't have outcomes. We don't have analysis. Absolutely nothing. And that's because some of the findings may unsettle the transgender community or may unsettle the conservative wing of the intellectual life in the United States, which is increasingly more vociferous and, may I say, uh, unduly aggressive. Four years later, 2022, there was a second paper published in the August issue of Pediatrics. The authors of the paper attempted to test the hypothesis of rapid onset gender dysphoria. And more specifically, they tried to ascertain or to measure the possible social contagion. But just to remind you, social contagion simply means if you're exposed to gender dysphoric people, you're more likely to become gender dysphoric yourself. This is the vector of social contagion. Now we have many, many phenomena which involve social contagion. Mob, mob psychology is an example. The behavior of crowds, cults. In many, many cases, we communicate behaviors to individuals via collectives or via um, social structures and social institutions, including peers, for example. So, 2022, the study was published. And it was, it was more substantial than the 2018 paper. Um, they checked the birth ratios between 2017 and 2019, the birth ratios of transgender diverse individuals to female sex at birth individuals. And the idea was to see um, if there is a decrease uh, or an increase in adolescents who self-identify as transgender diverse. In short, they establish a benchmark, how many people were, di were, were um, assigned female sex at birth, and then they followed up on these people, trying to see how many of them um, outed and declared themselves to be transgender diverse, how many adolescents identified as such. So the first thing they found, which is not surprising at all, is that people who identify as transgender or transgender diverse, they're subject to bullying, victimization, 
and the suicidality among these people, among this youth, is much higher when compared with cisgender peers. That, that came as no surprise to anyone. The authors concluded that actually their findings were, and I'm quoting, incongruent, incongruent, not supportive of the ROGD hypothesis. In other words, their findings did not show any social uh, contagion. And the reasoning behind this was, it is so difficult to be transgender. You pay such a high price socially, you're victimized, you're bullied, you're ridiculed, you're shunned. The price is so high uh, that it's very unlikely that you would try to emulate or imitate someone who is gender dysphoric. On the very contrary, you would try to keep away. So this was the 2022 um, conclusion. So what can we make of these two studies, which seem to be, uh, seem to contradict each other? Um, there is a general perception that there is an increase in prevalence of gender dysphoria. And this may be not entirely true. Perhaps the prevalence and incidence haven't changed, but what has changed is that people are more compassionate, more educating, more educated and, and more accepting. So it is less challenging to out yourself, to come out and acknowledge and admit and confess that you are gender dysphoric, especially in youth, among the, the young people. So are we, is the debate over? Can we now say safely that there is no um, social contagion? The transgender community and population, they feel very threatened by this idea of social contagion. Because if there is social contagion, and if it is considerable, then the whole transgender issue is nothing but a fad. It's a fashion. It's not real. It's not a clinical entity. It doesn't reflect any biological or psychological, true, veritable, verifiable processes. If, on the other hand, social contagion is very minimal, if, if at all, then we are talking about a real phenomenon. And unfortunately, there are no answers. We don't know. The samples are too small. The methodology is questioned. And academics are afraid. They're terrified. They don't dare to touch this issue. We must study this. Because if gender dysphoria is social contagion, especially among peer-sensitive adolescents. In adolescence, we know that peers are the main socialization agents. Peers teach you everything you know about sex. Peers exert pressure on sexual identity and sexual orientation and to a large extent form it. Peers have a huge role in gender formation, gender role formation and and um, sexual identity. If there is social contagion, we can put a stop to it. And we should even put a stop to it. If, however, social contagion is minimal, 1-2% of the cases, then we should revert to the opposite pole. We should affor afford and we should provide gender-affirming care. We should help youth to transition. Because then transgender is a real phenomenon. And here's the breaking news. We don't know yet scientifically if gender dysphoria is a real thing. We have no studies, no rigorous studies at least, which support either side of the debate conclusively. And that is a shame and a disgrace in 2022. In the meantime, because there's such a paucity of studies, such a dearth of data, everyone and his dog has a stake in the debate. Psychologists, psychiatrists, psychoanalysts, medical doctors, transgender, their families, their friends, 
conservatives and liberals, everyone is throwing, everyone is throwing his his or her head into the ring, and it's a melee. It's a it's a, a mess. It's a wrestling match rather than an informed medical debate because that's it boils down to a medical issue. It involves not only the mind; it involves the body. So we find, for example. Um, a month ago, February 15th, we find a series of announcements by Italian psychoanalysts and they oppose the use of puberty blockers for gender dysphoria. Um, the debate started in, in January when the Italian Psychoanalytic Society issued a call to the Ministry of Health signed by the president, the president uh, Thanopoulos. Thanopoulos is a Greek name, I don't know what he's doing in Italy. Okay, <laughs> so the, the document expressed, I, I quote, great concern about the use of drugs that block pubertal development of minors diagnosed with gender dysphoria. And then there was a list of warnings based on the idea that, and I'm quoting again, the ongoing trials circumvent careful scientific evaluation. And the document calls for rigorous discussion. I can't agree more. I fully agree. I agree with all these things. There's no serious scientific study of the issue and we need to become serious about it and we need to, to go rigorous. Um, so what do we base today? What do we base our diagnosis on? If there's no real science, there are no major studies, there are no big samples, there's no follow-up on what is happening to individuals having transition. What do we base all this on? Well, believe it or not, we base it on claims. <laughs> People come and say that they're gender dysphoric and that's where it begins and that's where it ends. There's no way to carefully and critically evaluate social identity in progress. The document says only a minority of children who state that they do not identify with their gender confirm this statement after puberty. Suspending or preventing psychosexual development while waiting for the maturation and definition of the child's stable identity is in contradiction with the fact that this development is a central factor in the process of identity definition. That's a very convoluted and long way of saying children have no clue as to what their gender or sex is. End of story. And quite true. We acquire these determinants of identity only in mid-adolescence, not earlier. So children can't make these decisions and can't report truthfully about their inner states because these inner states are in flux. They are not stable. They're not firm and they're definitely not lifelong. The statement by the Italian Psychoanalytic Society continued, even when the declared gender dysphoria in prepubertal age is confirmed during adolescence, the developmental arrest won't result in a body that is different from a sexual point of view from the original one. The sexual development of the body, even when it contradicts the internal orientation, allows an erotic fulfillment that a blocked or manipulated body does not offer. So here it's more debatable. Here it's more debatable. Many transgender people report that they're pretty happy with the new bodies they have. And um, this biological determinism, you're born with genitalia and the geni and genitalia determine your gender and how you function in society and basically your fate. That's, that belongs in the 1930s and 1940s. There is no place in postmodern society, on the one hand. So it's not true to say that once uh, gender orientation is, is becomes clear to the individual in adolescence, uh, transitioning to a different kind of body would be unsatisfactory. That's not true. That's not supported by anything. And the overwhelming vast majority of transgender people report exactly the opposite. And so, uh, a large number of social, professional social um, societies in Italy counter 
countermanded the letter of the psychoanalytic society and they published an open letter so italian society of endocrinology the italian society of pediatrics of pediatric endocrinology diabetology andrology sexology pediatric psychiatry national observatory of gender identity i mean a host of of a host of societies and, and associations um spring spring to the to to the rescue kind of the and they confronted the psychoanalytic society and that included the society of psychiatry national order of psychologists etc etc and so they said um, the text describes the treatment with hypothalamic blockers in adolescence with gender dysphoria is an experimental treatment but it is not in fact the therapy is approved in many countries in the world italy included and there there are very favorable opinions by bioethics committees all over the world and so these um, Italian societies and associations of professionals they wrote such medical treatment is reserved for carefully selected cases following multidisciplinary and personalized evaluation we agree that the scientific data available to date confirm that gender identity reaches stability only at pubertal age during adolescence and not in prepubertal pubertal age or in childhood. Therefore, as widely documented in international recommendations, hypothalamic blockers can be prescribed only when puberty is already underway, which is the way it should be all over the world, including in the United States. Transgender adolescents are very vulnerable. They have much higher rates of depression, anxiety, suicide risk, distress. Um, it's a conflict between one's feeling of oneself, one, one's experience of oneself, and one's body. In a way, the body is perceived as estranged or alien, or even as a traitor. There's a sense of betrayal sometimes. And these associations continued in their open letter to say, follow-up studies show that treatment with puberty blockers can significantly reduce behavioral and emotional problems and reduce suicidal risk, as well as improve overall psychological functioning in adolescents. And so there's a debate not only in the United States, uh, even in a, a way more traditional society like Italy. Um, the psychoanalytic society of Italy is right in, in saying the following. I'm quoting. There are no rigorous, carefully collected and independently controlled data, nor studies on the difference in terms of suicide between allegedly transgender kids who take the drug and those who do not. Dysphoria often coexists with mental disorders such as depression, eating disorders, or autism spectrum disorders. We need a differential diagnosis, but few people deal with it. And that is the core of the core of the problem. The problem is there is a surge of adolescents, including sometimes children, who claim that they don't feel gender-wise. Uh, there is a discrepancy between their gender roles as assigned by society mainly and their sex as determined by their genitalia at birth. And they would like to transition to create conformity, to create a strong association or correlation between equipment and its use or change the equipment, change the genitalia and other um, other sex organs and so on and so forth in order to reach such a conformity but so the problem is not this this is clearly a phenomenon the problem is we don't know enough we have no information we have no data about anything literally about anything is it socially communicable What's the influence of peers? 
we never conducted a study with control or control group. Um, how about um, are there any biological determinants that can be identified? I don't know hormones, something. Uh, is there a correlation? Um, is is there intergenerational intergenerational transmission, for example? Um, what's the effect of puberty blockers long term? There's no follow up. Can you believe this? There, there's no follow up that I'm aware of as to what what happens to transgender people having undergone interventions and treatments, and so. This debate is not going to end until we bravely tackle the issues that I've mentioned without fear and without censorship. And one of the main issues we need to, we need to study is something called detransitioning. Detransitioning is when transgender people regret the decisions they've made. Now, if you dare to mention the word detransition or the word regret in on any of the forums of transgender transgender people, you will be castigated, chastised, chastised, drawn and quartered, burned, and your ashes spread on all five oceans of the globe. These words are taboo, forbidden, verboten. Nichts, don't say them. It's as if there's no such thing. Transgender people essentially deny that there is such a thing. And the academic cohort that is, dare I say, financially invested in the transgender industry because it became a cottage industry, this academic cohort denies this, equally denies uh, detransitioning, the very existence of detransitioning. But the truth is detransitioning exists and there is a huge debate because there are no studies whether detransitioning constitutes 2% of the transgender population or is it closer to 35%. I refer you to studies by Dr. Kenan McKinnon. So transgender people, let's, let's be clear. The majority of transgender people are happy, content, and egocentric with their decisions. But there are, there are transgender people who have undergone interventions and treatments, including surgical treatments, and regret it, and are unha unhappy about it. This phenomenon is real. It exists. People who have people who have detransitioned or regret their decision to transition, they don't dare to speak out. It, they, they feel ashamed. They don't want to endanger the transgender community by providing weapons and arguments to the opposite side, to the conservative camp. So they keep mum. They keep quiet. They feel stupid. <laughs> they feel that they've made the wrong decision and no one likes to own up to making wrong decisions. And so um, it's, it's as if you're not allowed to speak about these experiences. Um, detransition, people who detransition deserve the same supportive care as young people who wish to transition. Detransitioning can even happen because gender identity is fluid. I keep telling you, it's all in flux. Um, and so we need to be compassionate about these people and we need to study them because studying the transition can shed light on the mechanics and the dynamics and the etiology of transitioning. In short, if we study why people regret transitioning, we're gonna learn a lot about transitioning. The decision-making that goes into transitioning the emotions, the cognitions, the, co the causation, what causes transitioning, the connectivity to gender and or sex, etc., etc. I think the transitioning is a rare, rare opportunity to learn the truth about gender dysphoria, tra uh, transgender 
phenomena and and so on and so forth i don't think they should be they should be shunned detransitioning is is rare is rare they're not absolute figures but many authorities say that it's something like two percent and so these cases are perceived to be isolated and and dangerous to the transgender community so ideology and politics trump excuse me for the word trump science like you're not supposed to study it because there's an there's an it, there's a campaign going on there's an agenda here there's a battle a war and you know you don't ask questions you don't cast doubts when a war is going on you're you're patriotic and you do your duty and you shut up and that is of course very wrong it's very wrong gender affirming care is a necessity in my view only in in late adolescence detransitioning um, is also a necessity we need to be tolerant of a two-way street never mind how how um, slack the traffic is either way we need to allow people to make choices even after they have made choices transitioning shouldn't be a dead end um, an irreversible co course of action transitioning should never be irrevocable and so we need to study this and the shocking truth is i know you, you're not going to believe me but the shocking truth is there are no large-scale studies tracking people who receive gender care as adolescents none there are no studies that, that asked adolescents who transitioned are you satisfied with your treatment now that you are much older you know you receive gender affirming care when you were 13 and then you you know you went through interventions and so on you when you were in your 20s and now that you're in your 40s are you happy with it are you satisfied have you done the right thing no one <laughs> there have been a series of studies and they had severe limitations some of them focused on people who received treatment as as adults not adolescents some followed patients for a short period of time others lost track of like 80 percent of the patients and so on and so forth um, mckinnon says there's a real need for more long-term studies that track patients for five years or longer many detransitioners talk about feeling good during the first few years of the transition and after that they may experience regret Dutch reporters, Dutch um, scientists, uh, researchers reported the results of a study which supposedly is, well, purportedly is the biggest study uh, ever. It was a study of transgender youths and they reviewed prescription drug records and so on. They found, the Dutch found that 704 out of 720 adolescents who started on puberty blockers before taking hormones continued with the treatment after four years 16 discontinued so this sits well with the two percent rule only two percent regret the decision this also would indicate that we are not dealing with social contagion if 98 percent of youth who transitioned and were treated, received gender affirming care, were treated with puberty blockers and so on. If 98% of them are happy with their decisions, satisfied, continue treatment after four years, that couldn't be merely peer pressure or social contagion. That reflects some real need, some real urge and desire to transition. And so regret is rare no one says it's not rare but even rare phenomena teach us a lot about the rule even small minorities um, edify us about the dynamics of majorities so we need we need to study um, we need to study this 
Dr. Marian van der Luce, um, which authored, was the lead author of this uh, study, she says, it's important to have evidence-based medicine instead of expert opinion or just opinion at all. <laughs> and she's right. Science is not about opinions. Science is reliable evidence, frequencies, tests, control groups. What the heck is going on? How can such a, a much disputed, most hotly disputed area, ethical debate, in modern life, ethical dilemma, um, remain so virgin in terms of scientific studies. Um, and they say we cannot, uh, there's a, a clinical psychologist, um, Edwards Lieper, and he says, um, we cannot carry on in this field that involves permanently changing young people's bodies if we don't fully understand what we are doing and learn from those we fail. We need to take responsibility as a medical and mental health community to see all the outcomes. Part of the problem is that this transitioning is ill-defined, like many other things in sexuality, sexual, in the study of sexuality. Detransitioning um, for those who transition socially may be another change in name preferred pronouns, dress, other forms of identity expression. So that's detransitioning. De For those who receive medical treatment, detransitioning typically includes halting hormone therapy. Um, so not all people who stop treatment, for example, report that they regret transitioning. So this, it's, this is a complex phenomenon, detransitioning. We have to separate the emotional side from the executive side, decisions to stop receiving treatment, from the social side. Um, some people just stop receiving hormone therapy when they've achieved certain physical changes with which they're comfortable. They go midway. Some are unhappy with the side effects of hormones. Um, some are unable to cope with long-standing social stigma and discrimination and so on and so forth. We need to go deep, and first and foremost, we need to we need to create a terminology, a dictionary, common to everyone. We don't have an argument in physics about what is energy or what is a black hole. It should be the same here. There shouldn't be arguments about what is gender, <laughs> what is dysphoria, what is detransitioning. Um, for example, patients who had their ovaries or testes removed no longer produce hormones that match the gender assigned at birth. And so what's happening with these people? We know that they pay a heavy medical price uh, and so on and so forth. How do, they, how do they perceive this medical price, side effects and so on? Are they angry? Are they happy? Is it, was it worth it? <laughs> and so on. Uh, Elie uh, van den Busche, um, an author of a study in, in, uh, in Germany, says many respondents describe experiences of outright rejection, outright rejection from the LGBT plus spaces due to their decision to transition or to detransition. So this intolerance should stop. On the one hand, the transgender community must open itself up and allow diversity and allow different voices to interact. And on the other hand, science should take gender dysphoria a lot more seriously and study the phenomenon time and again, rigorously, until we finally can tell the world and the adolescents who seek our help what the heck is going on. What is this entity that we are dealing with? Clinical, biological, social, peer pressure, what? And what would happen to them statistically should they choose different courses of treatment? I know no other field in medicine so neglected, so infantile, and so primitive after 40 years. It's a shame. Time to move on.
Welcome back and thank you for joining us. Uh, this part of the show is where we look at uh, mental health matters and all things to do with psychology. Um, stay with me because I'm just going to read out something that came out in the census. The uh, transgender and non-binary people have been counted for the very first time in the 220-year history of the census for England and Wales. It revealed that 262,000 people identify as a gender different to their sex registered at birth. Now, the England and Wales census also recorded sexuality for the first time with 1.5 million people aged over 15 or 3.2 percent identifying as gay or lesbian, bisexual or other sexual orientation. Uh, the charity Stonewall, which has long called for the inclusion of gender and sexual identity questions, described the results as an historic step. Uh, Canada has also um, recorded similar uh, figures. Now, a, a lot of people I have to say it's it's I don't include myself in this, but a lot of people will be asking why is LGBTQ plus? Why is it um, so prominent? Why do we keep hearing about it? I've heard people on this station and callers into many other stations say, uh, why do there seem to be so many LGBTQ or transgender or you know, why? Why is this such a thing at the moment? Uh, well, one reason is because people feel that they can talk about it um, more easily. That's not to say there aren't significant barriers and discrimination but that's one issue. Uh, is there anything else into the equation? Well, this is a question. I mean, my next guest, I, I'm thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to have. I know he got a huge response last time he was on the show. Uh, from Israel, Dr. Sam Vaknin, a Professor of Clinical Psychology. Sam, welcome back. I mean, our last talk, I, 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 I can't you, tell you how interesting it was. Love it, love it, love it. So, Jen gender wars and the emergence of a uni gender as i said i mean so many people are saying why is this a thing what's going on what is your take on this this is part of a historical process um the two world wars created a shortage of males and then uh, capitalism has transitioned into a paradigm of eternal growth constant growth continuous growth, which required the introduction of women into the workforce and also as consumers. Of course, we only have 24 hours a day. And if you spend your time at the workplace and then spend even more of your time consuming, then you have less time left for family, intimacy, marriage, and so on and so forth. And there has been a tectonic shift in the way genders interact and team up to reproduce and to perpetuate the species. This is um, one of the greatest revolutions in human history, uh, in my view. And the outcome was wow. the emergence of what I call the unigender. The unigender is a sex, a genderless person someone who identifies less with social constructs such as gender, stereotypical male or stereotypical female, and identifies much more, for example, with a career or with a lifestyle ah. or with a sexual preference or orientation rather than with gender. Gender was an organizing principle. Gender is performative. It's a social construct. It's actually a script. Mm -hmm. It's a form of acting. And so now we have different other scripts. So studies by Lisa Wade and many other scholars have, are showing that women are defining themselves as masculine, while men didn't complete the transition from masculine to feminine. And this is called the stalled revolution. Women have become men, but men have remained men. End result, we have so, a single so gender. So, so let me, when you say that, when you say it, that, that's taking it away from the social construct of what a man does and who he is and, and what have you, because before, up until recently, um, we had all sorts of, a, as you say, a script for what men were, identifying by what they did, their jobs, their roles in the family, etc. And likewise with women. With the erosion of that, with both sexes having, you know, with a lot of crossover, 
if you take yourself away from those constructs, from those definitions, like a man puts out the rubbish and does what have you, you then become what floating between the two. Because what, what I find is interesting in many African societies, before colonialism, before uh, invasion and all before slavery, because the tribe had to work together to get the harvest in, they couldn't, you know, one lot do one thing and one lot do another. Everyone had to work together. The constructs of, of male and female that we have in the West that we recognize, they weren't like that. And so you had many quote unquote genderless people that you looked at and you couldn't I readily identify as being a male or a female because people enveloped both sides just to just so the tribe could exist then along comes faith and religion and what have you and says no men do this women do that um but it, it, it's something that ha existed centuries or uh, you know hundreds of years ago and you're saying now it, it's it's coming back if you like it's coming to the west Yes, what's happening now is not that the the genders are exchanging scripts. Uh, it's not a swapping of scripts. It's a conversion, right. convergence on a single gender. And the gender is masculine. Yeah. Everyone is becoming masculine regardless of genitalia. Now, um, the construct of gender has emerged um, originally when people began to create surplus wealth. Prior to capitalism and prior to industrialism and prior to urbanism, we had hunter-gatherer societies. When we started, when we transitioned to agriculture, following the agricultural revolution, we started to generate surpluses. Surpluses accumulated as wealth and you needed to you needed to transmit this wealth from one generation to the next. And to do so, mm -hmm. you needed to control reproduction. You needed to be sure that your child is your child and not someone else's child. And to do to yeah, accomplish yeah. this certainty, you needed to imprison women, essentially. <laughs> to imprison yeah. women, to, to yes. keep them sequ yeah. sequestered. And this is when gender gender roles emerged culminating in the Victorian era. But today, of course, the emphasis is, is not so much on reproduction. There are numerous mechanisms for transmitting wealth. Everything is contractual. Mm. Scripts are fluid. Sex is fluid, et cetera, et cetera. So there's no need for the old constructs, such as family, such as marriage. Marriage had declined by 50%. That's five zero percent from 1990. <laughs> We don't need these institutions anymore. Yeah. And one of the institutions we're getting rid of is gender. However, it is very unfortunate that we have converged on a single gender that is toxic. Both women and Why? men. Why? Why is it toxic? It's mm. toxic because women have adopted a male role model, which is psychopathic, narcissistic, aggressive, bullying, disempathic. Women did not adopt a male role model, which is hardworking, altruistic, empathic, loving, compassionate, caring, and protective. Women are emulating and imitating the worst conceivable men. And men are doing the same. So we have a toxic convergence. We, the unigender is but a why, toxic but why? So, so why is that? Why is that? Is it because uh, it's still seen as all of those negative values that you talk, the narcissistic one, the aggressive ones, are still seen as the tools of power? Is it because being male or being seen as being more male or having more quote unquote male qualities is seen as the path to having power and control? Men have not become more feminine. Men have remained mm. stereotypically masculine, almost a caricature of masculinity. Women have transitioned to toxic masculinity rather than men. Men have remained stuck there. <laughs> so we have a situation where everyone agrees that values such as ambition, callousness, ruthlessness, 
suppression of empathy, competitiveness, um, and so on and so forth, everyone agrees now, men and women alike agree, that this should be the guiding light. This should be the northern star of one's life. Today, two and a half times more people say that they would prefer a career to a relationship lifelong. 38% of people oh, in, in the United States are lifelong singles by decision. So we, we have created a masculine world, which is a caricature of what ma real healthy masculinity is. And then we have adhered to it, mm. male and female alike. And this is the unigender. It's a toxic, sick, pathological construct. Now, what about gay gay men then? A lot of people would say that, uh, and it's a generalization, I know, because, uh, you know, but uh, a lot of people would see uh, very gay of you, like very camp men, let's say camp, because, you know, you could be camp and, and not gay, but very camp men as having uh, what we see as female qualities or... Is that just the guys? Is that a caricature of female qualities? Many, many women would tell you that the best thing that could happen is having a gay friend, someone you can trust without <laughs> the without the constraints of sexual expectations and even sexual assault, because sexual assault mm -hmm. is on the rise. Sexual practices are heavily influenced by pornography, yeah, yeah. heavily influenced by pornography, and these practices have entered the daily sexual practice of the vast majority of young people under age 35. Mm. Sex today is a ritualized form of extreme aggression. Not, there's nothing there really? anymore. You think that... Yes, please. Really? I mean, I mean th there are people like Andrew Tate. I don't know if you've heard about that influence as Andrew Tate. Uh, and then there's the incel, you know, the whole incel movement as well, which is women hating, uh, feminine quality hating, if you like, and promotes uh, violence against women and what have you. But I mean, many of us would see that as, as something that's fringe. But but let's just come back to the previous point that when with gay or very camp, camp men, then where do they lie in all of this? Do they not have more quote unquote feminine qualities or is that a guise? Feminine and, feminine and masculine, as I said, are, are social constructs. So, of course, a guy yeah, can be yeah. feminine. <laughs> a guy can be feminine without being gay. Femininity is simply yeah. a set, a list of traits and, and behaviors which denote, for example, enhanced empathy, caring, and connectivity, rather than aggression and competitiveness, which are stereotypically masculine. But um gay gay men aside i don't see any other enclaves of femininity even among women and when i said that sex is ritualized aggression regrettably it's also among the gay community sex in general is mm. becoming way more aggressive for example the incidence of choking on on sexual dates has quintupled in the past 10 years alone Anal sex had replaced vaginal sex as the main practice. And anal sex is very painful to women. So mm. the, there's an orgasm gap. Women experience orgasm six times less than men in most sexual encounters, which are not committed, which are not in committed relationships, and so on and so forth. And these well, practices obviously, because, prevail... obviously, we just went... Sorry, Sam, just because we're talking in a day, we've got to be slightly less less graphic. But do you think that's because of the rise of, of, of and you mentioned pornography, and, um, you yes. know, we talked on this show about many young people learning about sex through pornography. But let, coming back to the role of the roles of men and women and, and what you're saying about women becoming more, uh, you know, taking up the, the, the negative qualities of being uh, masculine, is that the way do you see that's the way it's going to go that's the way it is is it a is it a fad is it a tide or is it this is this is what's happening to humanity um that we'll see more and more and more uh it's interesting that i'm just thinking of uh, apparently there are more when it comes to actually uh, and that's another issue about people who say um i'm not born the sex that i I am, if you like, and having um, 
you know, changing their gender through, through um, you know, surgery and what have you, there's quite a big increase. I know that there's a big increase in women, at least if they don't go the whole way, but re having their breasts removed. Um, and there's quite a big increase between uh, more so uh, than women doing that than, than men, because it's it's so difficult to come from a position of, male power if you like to um you know transitioning to a woman because it's it's it, you've, you may have the operation what have you but then your status uh, everything changes so much so you know do, do you see this basically i'm asking just to, to finish up is this the way it's always going to be is this a t the beginning of a tide or is it a trend no i think that's the way it's going to be and i think that's the way it's going to be for several reasons one women men have uh, men have walked away men going their own way men have walked away they refuse to accept responsibility they refuse to commit they refuse to invest they refuse to form families they refuse to engage in relationships um and so on and so forth in the absence of men women have to be men they have to fend off for themselves they have to work hard they have to make money they have to attain financial independence and they can't trust men to be there for them as they used to. This is point number one. Point number two, uh, capitalism and the and technologies, various technologies, encourage women and men to be atomized. They encourage them to be self-sufficient, to need no one and to interact with no one. Because there's a very simple trade-off. Any minute you give to your spouse, any minute you give to your boyfriend, any minute you give to your child is a minute taken away from Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Oh, yes. So, yes. And so there is a built in incentive for technologies and capitalism to destroy your intimacy and your human relationships because they take you away from them. Capitalism today wow. is built on an unsustainable paradigm. It's built on the paradigm of eternal growth. And so for, for capitalistic societies to grow eternally, they need to generate consumption all the time. They need to, to interpolate you. They need to brainwash you into consumption. Now, if yeah. you are, if you are um, 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 a single and you work, then consumption becomes your religion and your anxiolytic, your anxiety reducing activity. You consume in order to reduce or control anxiety. And this is precisely what capitalism wants, the current iteration of capitalism. So everyone is encouraged to live alone, to consume Netflix, to consume online, to not, pay, to not interact with other people because it takes away from profit. Everything is bottom line oriented. And of course, women, play the game because it's the only game in town and the irony wow. is wow. the irony is this is a male game it's not a female game third and fourth generation feminism sold out women to men because today Whoa. women today women construct themselves to fit into a male world they they behave they convert themselves into sexual objects for the male gaze and the male grasp and the male use. It's, wow. it's this yeah. is more of a male. There's a lot there, of, sir. This is the. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just like whoa. There's a lot. There's a lot there, and I'm I'm sure. I mean, I'd love to dis. I'd love to discuss it even further. I know there's a there's a lot there, a lot there. Sam, I, I hate to cut you short because uh, it is a very it's very provocative what you're saying, and I'd love to go into it further. And indeed, we must on another show, but unfortunately, have run out of time. But wow, lots to think about, Sam. That's why I I love talking with you because it, it makes like smoke come out of people's ears and go away and consider things and at least think things through. So please, Sam, do come back and join us on a, on a future show. Uh, Dr. Sam Vaknin, uh, Professor of Clinical Psychology. And if you, that doesn't make you think, however you think about that, I'm sure you're all arguing about it somewhere in your household and what have you, but at least we've made you think. If that doesn't make you think, nothing will. Dr. Sam Vaknin uh, there, 
um, on why he thinks says is that we've all come to one sex and it's not just about sex, it's about society, it's about consumerism and a whole lot of other things. Wow, lots to think about there. Uh, we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to come back to your phone calls and messages of which there have been lots. Back in a moment. 